block of issues. The question of regulation, cybersecurity, taxation, and other related matter. Mr. David Stansel, cryptocurrency specialist, trader, and researcher, Slovakia. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So today I would like to speak briefly about a very exciting topic, the, the biggest challenges of cryptocurrencies when it comes to the regulation. So let me start, let me, let me start straight away with the first one. And that being is that um, to get the trends right, a lot of things uh, are happening, not only in the cryptocurrency space, but also in the AI, machine learning, drones, and all other possible buzzwords. And for the government, it's very important to watch these industries very closely uh, and to try to find out which directions these industries are going and also where the new industries are being created. And the reason for that is because we don't want to end up like this. Who in the audience know what is this picture about? Raise your hands. OK, not many. Good. So um, this is the later part of the 19th century in the UK. It is so-called uh, Black Flag Act, which introduced a law uh, that said that each car had to follow this very nice uh, in front of it walking gentleman with a black flag, warning environment around it that the source or like a dangerous object is coming. And uh, these overprotecting ambitions of regulators resulted in a situation where like, the whole economic activity within the automotive industry has shifted away from the UK to other countries, such as, such as Germany. And today, we can see a very similar pattern in the cryptocurrency market. Uh, there are lots of countries that they realize what kind of economic value and growth can be generated by this whole industry. And now I'm not talking only about uh, billions of dollars raised uh, through ICOs, but also about the whole transformation of the legacy kinds of assets to the new infrastructure and possibly many more. So there are few countries that uh, seem to get it right and they are trying to pro tackle, this, uh, tackle this issue. There are few countries that are trying to fight it. And nonetheless, it's uh, very important to realize, not only for governments, that these technologies, cryptocurrencies and open blockchain are here to stay with us. And uh, chances are that in the near future, we will interact with them in various um, areas in our daily lives. The reason for that is that they foster the paradigm shift into, what is, into something what is often referred to as Web 3.0, where legacy kind of application systems can be rebuilt in a completely novel, distributed way. So uh, once we overcome this challenge, there is another one ahead of us, and that is to get the actual facts right. Because when we talk about uh, cryptocurrencies, there are um, good chances that one may encounter a lot of myths and rumors that are very common in this space. And when we think of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a new kind of, parallel, new kind of financial system, a parallel financial system, and we compare it to the legacy financial system, uh, we, we find out that actually the new one is not so bad and there are certain merits to it, especially when we compare the all kind of social, economic and environmental costs that either of the systems uh, incur. To be fair, these numbers are a bit older, so probably all the numbers for the Bitcoin would be doubled or tripled by now. But still, if you look at it and you compare it, it's still just a tiny fraction compared to the legacy system. So many of you have probably heard about the recent scandal of the Danske Bank from a few weeks ago, when the uh, amount of money that was uh, laundered through this bank was somewhere around $200 billion, which was at that point bigger than the whole cryptocurrency market capitalization. 
And, and I don't even think there is much else needed to add here, because when we talk about money laundering and cryptocurrencies, uh, fair enough, the, the potential is there, but we have definitely much bigger fishes to fry. And um, so one we, once we can overcome also this mental challenge, there is uh, another one, even more complicated one, ahead of us as well. Um, of course, the approach to cryptocurrency regulations might be um, quite problematic, because uh, in many countries, we see the debates and disputes over which actual supervisors and regulatory uh, authorities should uh, apply their regulations. And the reason for that is that we simply deal with a new asset class. Of course, many ICOs and maybe coins are very similar or even equal, equal to the legacy assets, but many of them are simply new asset class that we have to deal with. And once we answer the, this question, the first one, it has tremendous impact on other areas, just, such as taxation and accounting. But uh, more importantly, blockchain-based solutions raise really important legal questions in both financial and uh, non-financial applications. And especially when we talk about implementation of blockchain into the public sector, the, the challenge is not only to transform the old business processes and the old ways of doing things onto the new infrastructure, but also to innovate and rethink these processes. Because what we know is that the middleman can be skipped, the rules can be baked into the code, and the role of a regulator can be distributed over the network. And of course, regulators have a plethora of actions and the legal tools they can use to do so. But before they do so, it's, uh, it might be beneficial to follow advices from institutions such as European Securities and Markets Authority, which uh, last year released very interesting research where they concluded that all kinds of attempts for regulation at this point might be premature and most likely wrong. And we heard similar things from uh, the G20 meetings earlier this year as well. That being said, a lot of countries are competing now in the race to become the best and most crypto-friendly jurisdiction. So what does it take? So you definitely need government support, but government support alone is uh, not enough. It takes more hash rate to do this, and you definitely need uh, sufficiently enough developed business ecosystem. It's good to have proactive regulators, especially uh, these can be especially helpful with onboarding the, f the, the old banking world actors on board. And all this needs to be wrapped in a stable regulatory framework. So when we talk about crypto-friendly jurisdictions, there are a few countries, especially here in Europe, that always pop up. And as you can see, all of them have government support. Fewer of them have actually some proactive regulators willing to deal with this issue. And very few, if not the only ones so far, have actually the financial system aligned as well. In the case of Liechtenstein, it's because of the, of the bank Frick, which is at this point probably still the only bank willing to serve cryptocurrency businesses. And uh, so when we take a look at these countries and, and what they are doing, we find different approaches. Uh, in some countries, such as Malta, there are very specific and explicit rules that directly regulate ICOs, that uh, create a new regulatory authority, and that explicitly regulate ser centralized service providers. In some other countries, such as Gibraltar, we see a little bit different approach, a principle-based approach, where there are no strict and explicit rules, but rather projects that are applying for approval from the regulators need to, in their applications, 
convince uh, the regulators that they are compliant with the nine very broad principles. And again, different approach we can see in countries like Switzerland, where there are, again, no sp specific laws regarding the cryptocurrencies. Rather, we have some guidelines that are dealing with ICOs from financial regulators, such as FINMA. And so when we compile all this, uh, we get uh, four maybe simple principles that is good to follow when we talk about crypto regulation. And uh, so first, uh, it's, it seems to be reasonable to, for government to create a dedicated team for this issue. It doesn't have to necessarily be a new regulatory um, institution, but it's okay to have at least a dedicated team that consists of different teams from different regulators. And uh, more importantly, it's important to it's crucial to allow for breathing room, to allow the innovators, the fintech businesses, and uh, all these companies to bring in their innovations and to give them freedom to develop their products without having to be worried about some later on about regulatory fines. Equally important is also for regulators to work closely with these companies to listen and learn and uh, to listen and learn in order to be able to adapt the old rules for the new upcoming age. And last but not least, uh, it is not good for governments to try to enforce some specific standards on the industry. Rather, it is crucial to let these standards and best practices to be evolved from the market, ideally, from the free market. Thank you.